Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder, and today we're going to delve into the second half of Domain 2 and talk about Chapter 3, which is Sensation and Perception. Today we're going to focus on Sensation. Learning targets today are to talk about the differences between sensation and perception, the process of sensation, the concepts of what a threshold and adaptation are, the physical energy forms for which we do have sensory receptors, and our visual sensory system. So let's go ahead and get started. The sensation and perception, you may think they're the same thing, but in psychology they're not. Sensation is the physical stimulation of your sensory receptors and that raw data and information being taken in by you. Now the perception happens in your mind. It is the process of bringing meaning to these sensations by collecting, organizing, and interpreting the raw data. So you may hear sound at first and then you may realize through, uh, you hear sound and that is the sensation, but then you may realize that it is music that is perceiving the sound as what it is meant to be. So the process of sensation happens uh, with special types of neurons. We've talked about neurons in here before, but these are special neuron receptor sites in the sense organs, which, trig which uh, triggers conversion of various forms of outside stimuli into electric signals that can be sent to the brain. And transduction is the process of converting outside stimuli into neural activity. You're transducing it or transforming it into neural activity. And the sensory receptors are specialized forms of neurons stimulated by different kinds of energy, like light, vibrations, and pressure. So in your eye, you have retina, or your retina on the back of your eye is your sensory receptors for light. You have uh, fluid in your ear that gets vibrated and that triggers neurons that sends electric signals to your brain for hearing. Your touch uh, senses, your taste senses, uh, neurons on your tongue. Those are all specialized forms of neurons to help you interpret uh, these sensations coming in. Sensory thresholds and absolute thresholds are... Uh, <clears throat> points at which uh, we can recognize sensations. So a sensory threshold is the point at which a sensation begins and ends. Like I can only see certain kinds of light on the photo or on the electromagnetic spectrum of energy. I can't see x-rays. I don't have a sensory receptor for x-rays. I can see the, and why they call it, the visible light portion of the spectrum. And um, Weber's law is just noticeable differences. It's called the difference threshold. It's the smallest amount of difference between two stimuli that uh, can be detectable 50% of the time. And it's always constant. So the light that I am able to see from 30 miles away is one candle flame. And that's called your absolute threshold, by the way. The absolute threshold is what you can see 50% of the time. It's the lowest level. So if it was pitch black and I could see 30 miles away, I would be able to make out one candle light. That's pretty powerful. Now, how many more candles would you have to add to that for me to tell the difference that, okay, it got brighter? And then that is your difference threshold. We're going to call it difference threshold or not not just noticeable differences, we'll use different threshold and absolute threshold in this class. Uh, subliminal stimuli are stimuli that are below the level of conscious awareness. So you've heard of subliminal advertising, which is uh, bull crap, by the way. Uh, it's just strong enough to activate the sensory receptors, but not strong enough for people to be consciously aware of it. And the subliminal perception of it is that it acts upon the unconscious mind, which still influences your behavior. You're just not aware of it. And yes, uh, advertising does have subliminal di messages in it, but it has not proven to make you want to buy or buy anything else. Here are some examples of absolute thresholds. And yes, they see uh, 
pretty they seem pretty weird but it is just an example of how we measure uh what our sight threshold is what our hearing threshold is etc uh signal detection theory in this is has to do with instead of just us being passive receivers of sensations other factors it, um, motivate and change our expectation of our sensory processes. So it, uh, the signal detection theory states that motivation, biases, and ex expectations influence our detection of a stimulus. So have you ever uh, thought you got in a text message and he heard your phone, but then you look and it's not there, there's no text message, you never heard it? That's signal detection theory. So reactions to the stimulus must be categorized as a hit, miss, false alarm, or correct rejection. And here is the actual figure. Um, so if there was a signal and you responded to it, that would be in the upper left-hand corner. That'd be a hit. If there was a signal and you did not respond to it, that's a false alarm. If there was a signal and you did not respond to it, that is a miss. And if there was not a signal and you did not respond to it, that is a correct rejection. So this is signal detection theory um, in a chart, basically. Habituation and sensory adaptation. These are going to be two things that are very, very similar, but different. Subtle differences between them. In habituation, the lower centers of the brain filter out um, your attention to stimuli that do not change. So in the classroom, you won't even be aware that the uh, air conditioner is going until it shuts off and then the room becomes eerily silent. And so this is, the sensory receptors are responding to simulation, but we're not sending anything to your cortex. It filters out the unchanging stimuli. And then sensory adaptation is the cells themselves. And I like to use the example of once you get in a swimming pool, it's really, really cold at first. But then after five, ten minutes, you become used to it because your sensory receptor cells become less responsive to the temperature of the water because it's not changing. You get used to it. So sensory adaptation is the cells themselves. Habituation is the brain filtering out uh, the unchanging stimuli. And we're not going to worry about that. Sensation. Uh, when does it occur? It occurs when the special receptor sites on the neurons are activated uh, and various forms of outside stimuli are transduced into neural signals in the brain. So your eye receptors are triggered by electromagnetic energy, uh, like I said before, in the form of visible light. Your ear receptors are triggered by molecules of vibrating air and your touch receptors are triggered by pressure or temperature. Here is the forms of energy we can sense. So let's talk about seeing. The light has properties of both waves and particles, and we've learned this in science class before. Light is made up of photons, which are tiny packets of waves with specific wavelengths, and our brain has three perceptions of light, and that is brightness, color, and saturation. The brightness is determined by the amplitude of the wave, or how high or low the wave actually is. The higher the wave, the brighter the light. Visible spectrum in the, uh, is the portion of the whole spectrum of light that is visible to the human eye. We've already talked about that. The color of light is determined by the length of the wave. Long wavelengths are found at the red end of the spectrum, and shorter wavelengths are found at the blue end of the spectrum. And that is why the sky is blue, because those shorter wavelengths can penetrate the ozone layer. And then the saturation, or the purity of color that people perceive, uh, the less saturated it is means that it contains a mixture of wavelengths making up the color. A highly saturated red, for example, would contain only red wavelengths. If we mix in black or gray, it lessens the saturation. Optical illusions are signals. Uh, basically, you're, the light is playing tricks on you. And so the, a single point of light from a source travels through the structure of the eye and ends up on the retina as a single point 
Um, these optical illusions are usually, or at least this one, you can see the straw appears bent, but this is due to the refraction of light. And there are others, and we'll do an optical illusion uh, activity in class as well. Now, what I wanted to get to last is the structure of the eye. And here you can see light entering the eye, passing first through the cornea, which is the protective covering on the outside, then through the aqueous humor, which is the clear liquid in the front that nourishes the eye. Uh, the iris is the muscle, it's the colored part of your eye, and it controls the size of the pupil, which is the actual opening in the eye. And th um, the iris changes the size and this lets in more light or less light. If you do an experiment and go home and stand in your bathroom or something with the lights off or your eyes closed for like a minute, and then open them up, you'll see your pupils are really, really big, but then your iris, you'll see it contract. It's really, really weird. I recommend it. The lens is a fluid filled and it can change shape uh, depending on what you're trying to focus on, if you're trying to focus on something far away or up close. The vitreous humor is the jelly in the middle of the eye that gives the eye its shape and nourishes the eye the retina is the back of the eye, like the film of an old camera, which contains photoreceptor cells, and we'll talk about that in a second. The fovea is in the middle of the retina, and it is the greatest density of photoreceptors, so it's w usually whatever you're staring at is directed onto your fovea. It's probably about the size of your thumbnail. That is exactly what you can focus on. Uh, the blind spot on the back is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. There is no, there are no photoreceptors there, and so there is a blind spot in both of your eyes. But since we have stereoscopic vision, the other eye makes up for the blind spot in the first eye. And then the optic nerve is what sends the visual signals to the brain. So here's all that stuff. We talked about the cornea. So I'll let you jot that down if you wish. Aqueous humor, pupil, iris, which is the round muscle, the colored part of the eye. The lens is sus suspended by muscles, and it can change shape, um, which focuses the object onto the back of the eye. Visual accommodation is what we call the changing in the thickness of the lens. Uh, don't worry about presbyo presbyopia. Uh, the aqueous humor we talked about is in the front or I'm sorry, that's the vitreous humor. It fills the open space behind the lens. The retina is the final stop. Uh, don't worry about the ganglion cells or the bipolar cells. We're just going to focus on the rods and the cones in the retina. Rods and cones, here we go. Here's new stuff. Rods and cones are responsible for your vision. Uh, they are the special photoreceptor cells that respond to various wavelengths of light. Um, they receive the photons of light that come into the eye and transduce them into neural signals uh, to the brain. Rods are responsible, basically, uh, they're more, con they're more uh, centered on the outsides of your eye, and they basically focus on brightness. Uh, so they are non-color sensitivity to low levels of light. That's why when you're in low levels of light, everything may appear to be gray. So they are all over the retina, more to the outsides, and the fovea is in the center. Um, and they are brightness. Cones are what does color and sharpness of vision. They're concentrated in the middle at the fovea. They are the receptors. They have the greatest visual acuity. So they're more powerful than the rods, but the rods um, do your sensitivity to brightness of light. Cones do color. They work best in bright light. That's why you can see colors in bright light. And they have different sensitivity to different wavelengths of light. And then, like I said, the blind spot is where it exits the eye. In nearsightedness and farsightedness are the actual shapes of the eye. And it uh, can change where the focus is if it's too far away or too close just so you know what nearsightedness and farsightedness is. Mr. Snyder is nearsighted. 
Here's a blind spot demonstration. It's I think it's easier to do out of the book, but if you'd like to try it right here, move your head slowly back and forth to the screen, and hopefully if you follow the directions, the cat will disappear. And then how the eye works, focusing in on dark versus light adaptation. Dark adaptation is your eye's sensitivity to darkness. So it's like if you go into a room and you turn out the lights, your eye has to adapt to that. So your uh, pupil gets bigger, your iris uh, opens up, and up to 40 minutes later into the darkness, your eyesight can improve. Light adaptation, on the other hand, is happens in just a few minutes, and when you turn on the lights, it may seem extremely bright, you know, when you wake up in the morning, and that happens in just minutes, so dark adaptation takes a lot longer. How do we perceive color? Well, there's two major theories. There's trichromatic theory and opponent process theory. Trichromatic theory says that there's three types of cones, red, blue, and green and they correspond to different amounts of lights received by these cones and the combination of the cones firing gives different colors and they fire their message to the brain's vision center and that is what determines the color that you see. Opponent process theory says that visual neurons are stimulated by light of one color and inhibited by light of another color. So after images, are images that occur when a visual sensation persists for a brief time after the original stimulus is removed. And this happens in the LGN of the thalamus in the middle of your brain. And here's an example. Uh, if you look at this for long enough and you pause it and you look away, you will see what is a true American flag. And then color blindness, also occur, uh, termed color deficient vision, is uh, caused by having defective cones in the retina of the eye. You have one type of cone that does not work properly, and there are tests online. I'll provide a test in class for you to see if you are colorblind. But in the left, you should see a number 8, and in the right, you should see a number 96. But if you have certain types of colorblindness, you will not see these. That is all I have for you as far as the eyes go. Make sure you write down all these learning targets and bring them back to class, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.